Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar entitled A Roadmap to the 2016 Maryland Guidelines for the Assessment and Management of Childhood-Led Exposure. With us today are our two presenters, Dr. Cliff Mitchell from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Ruth Ann Norton of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Clifford S. Mitchell is the Director of the Environmental Health Bureau at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The Bureau's responsibilities include food protection, environmental, occupational, and injury epidemiology, and a wide array of healthy homes programs. He joined DHMH in 2006 after 14 years on the faculty of Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Mitchell received a BA from Williams College, an MS from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and an MD degree from Case Western Reserve University, and his MPH from the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. Dr. Mitchell serves as principal investigator for a number of projects in the department, including climate change, environmental public health tracking, occupational injury and illness surveillance, violent death surveillance, and the department's food protection rapid response team. He also serves on a number of national and state advisory committees. Ruth Ann Norton serves as president and CEO of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, a national nonprofit founded in 1986, dedicated to the elimination of childhood-led poisoning and the creation of healthy, safe, and energy efficient housing for America's children. A dedicated advocate for healthy housing, she broadened the mission of the organization, formerly known as the Coalition to End Childhood Lead Poisoning, by designing a groundbreaking national program built on the framework of cross-sector collaboration to efficiently deliver green, healthy, and safe homes in communities throughout the United States. One of the nation's leading experts on healthy housing, Ms. Norton led efforts to reduce childhood lead poisoning by 98% in the state of Maryland. She also developed and implemented one of the nation's first healthy homes programs to address the multiple environmental health and safety hazards in low and very low income housing for pregnant women. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Mitchell to begin the presentation. Thank you, Alex. And uh, before we start, I want to thank both uh, Ruth Ann Norton and the uh, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative for hosting this webinar. Uh, which is uh, a very useful and informative way of having, helping the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, get the word out about our new regulations on lead poisoning screening. So what I'd like to do is start with a poll, uh, just briefly asking you where you get your information on uh, lead issues. So Alex, if you can pull up the first poll, um, and what you'll see in front of you is a series of questions about where you go first for information about lead. So we're going to give you a couple of seconds to click in and uh, respond, and then we'll go ahead and start with the webinar. Okay. So terrific, you guys are uh, clicking in, um, and uh, this, is, this kind of information is very useful for us in terms of helping us respond better to community needs uh, and concerns and questions related to lead screening, poisoning prevention, uh, and clinical management of lead. So at this point, um, Almost 70% of you have voted. Uh, we'll leave the poll for about a minute more, for about 30 seconds more, so you can all respond, uh, and then we'll proceed. Okay. So uh, if we can have the next slide then. So we have a couple of things that we're going to try to do. Uh, as we move through this webinar. Um, and uh, just to uh, let you know, we're going to spend today talking with you uh, as clinicians, providers, case managers, school health personnel, people involved in community response to lead, insurance folks, uh, and others, to be familiar with the new lead poisoning screening requirements for children in Maryland, uh, to understand the reasons for the new requirements, and to be comfortable managing patients with lead exposures and to know what clinical and non-clinical resources are available to assist in that management. Next slide. So in 2012, as you all probably are familiar, CDC 
uh, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene following suit, uh, adopted recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention, which changed what had been a, quote, level of concern of 10 micrograms per deciliter to a new reference level of 5 micrograms per deciliter. I'm not going to go through all the reasons for that, but one of the big reasons was that we know there is no safe level of lead in the body. We know that lead doesn't serve a biological purpose in the body, and we know that due to epidemiologic studies, particularly cognitive studies, neurocognitive studies in young children, that there are population neurocognitive impacts on children even below the level of 10 micrograms per deciliter, which had been the previous uh, level of concern. So, uh, in 2011, the, two, the advisory committee recommended uh, that the level be reduced to a reference level of uh, 5 micrograms per deciliter, based in part on national uh, data showing that 97.5% of children in the United States had a level less than 5 micrograms per deciliter, so that overall in the population, only 2.5% of children had a lead level of 5 or greater. It is important to know, and we'll go through this in a little more detail, that in Maryland, although the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has reduced what is the clinical level uh, at which we expect providers to manage lead, the legal limit here in Maryland as of today still, as we'll discuss, is still 10 micrograms in a legal definition of what is considered lead poisoning. But our emphasis today is on the clinical management of lead and reducing lead levels in the population. Um, one of the other reasons that we've been looking at, at changing our regulations is because overall in the state, the lead levels uh, in the population, in the lead testing rates in the population uh, have been decreasing. Um, uh, and we'll show that in a minute. But in addition, the testing rates overall in the population have been declining and are still under what we would hope uh, would be the percentage of children tested in the state. In addition, because of the success of the Maryland Department of the Environment, uh, led advocates and community-based organizations and others in identifying what are the legally covered properties which have to be remediated under Maryland law, uh, as you'll hear more about from Ruth Ann Norton, um, the Department of the Environment and home, uh, uh, building owners, property owners, have been successful in remediating med lead, many lead properties, and we've actually seen a reduction. We've seen more and more properties being remediated. And finally, we're seeing the profile of lead exposure changing um, as more children are identified with lead sources that were not traditionally where lead poisoning occurred in the state. So as you'll see in the next slide, um, if you look at our new goals, our new goals are to increase testing rates across the state, to identify a larger proportion of the children who are exposed, to understand where lead exposures in Maryland are taking place today so that we can better target risk reduction, primary prevention efforts, and lead testing in the future, and finally, our ultimate goal is to reduce and ultimately eliminate lead poisoning among all of Maryland's children. So, who needs testing? Well, uh, as of or prior to March 28th of 2016, um, Maryland regulations, that's the Code of Maryland Regulations, that's COMAR, 10110404, required blood tests for all children who are enrolled in Medicaid at the age of 12 and 24 months, for children who lived in at-risk zip codes, which were defined in the 2004 targeting plan at their 12 and 24 month visits, for children who had, been, who had lived or were living in at-risk zip codes if they were older than 24 months and they had not previously been tested up to the age of six, and finally, children with risks according to a screening questionnaire that showed that they had at least one uh, potential risk factor for lead exposure. Next slide. Now, uh, what you see in front of you is the back page of a two-page laminated uh, clinical guidance which is being sent to 
healthcare providers, insurers, and others across the state. So in the next month or so, in the next couple of months, we'll be distributing a series of these templates, which are clinical guidance documents uh, laminated that can be used to help you as providers uh, and you who are involved in lead poisoning screening to, uh, uh, to uh, manage lead more effectively. Uh, in addition, this is currently available for download as a PDF document on the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene website uh, at our lead poisoning screening website. Next slide. So uh, what you saw in that back slide was a series of profiles and this is just to show you that um, the at-risk zip codes in the 2004 targeting plan include all of Baltimore City, a large portion of Baltimore County, and many of the older housing areas in Maryland. So that included uh, uh, large chunks of uh, the uh, large portions of the, of the Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, it also includes uh, portions of the older parts of uh, Cumberland, Frederick County, uh, Frederick City, um, and uh, as I said, it's primarily based on housing age across the state. Um, in addition, uh, it also shows that uh, there are large portions of the uh, large portions of the state which had not previously had testing required because their housing stock was largely built uh, after 1978. Next slide. Now, uh, the uh, tables that you see here on the back of the clinical guidance document include the uh, questions that are used by providers when they should be screening uh, children between the, 12th and, between the 12 and 24 month visits and then subsequently afterwards. Uh, it's important to ask parents whether or not their children have risks and we recommend essentially uh, thinking about using this questionnaire at any well, well child care visit because children, uh, once they are mobile and once they're capable of putting things in their mouth, uh, they are capable of getting lead dust or other, uh, or other sources of lead into their uh, system. So these questions include uh, questions related to the kind of housing that people live in, whether or not there's any family member or, or playmate or neighbor who has lead poisoning, uh, whether or not the parents uh, or the child lives in or spends a lot of time in areas that would be considered at risk, uh, or otherwise has potential sources, including occupational sources, that might potentially uh, put the child at risk. And as I said, uh, if there's a, even a single answer uh, to any of these, in the, uh, which would be a yes, uh, that child should be considered for uh, lead screening, a uh, lead poison testing, uh, blood lead testing. Next slide. Now, as of March 28, 2016, the picture, or the regulatory picture here in the state has changed. Uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which uh, uh, regulates lead poisoning screening testing regulations for providers, now requires that for children born on or after January 1, 2015, that regardless of where they live in the state, they should be considered, those, all of those areas of the state should be considered as at risk. And therefore, any child born on or after January 1st, 2015, should receive a lead blood test at the age of 12 months or 24 months. Um, children who are born before January 1st, 2015, should still be considered as under the previous regulations. So they would still be tested if they met the criteria that I mentioned before on Medicaid uh, or living in a, a, a risk area and at risk zip code as defined in the 2004 targeting plan. But children who are born after John, January 1st, 2015, those children, regardless of their Medicaid status, regardless of where they live, should all be tested at the age of 12 and 24 months. And finally, and most important, and, and equally importantly, Clinically, we expect and want providers to follow up on any blood lead that is 5 micrograms per deciliter or greater for clinical purposes, although, as I mentioned, the Department of Environment Law, as of today, still considers lead poisoning to be 10 micrograms per deciliter or greater. Next slide. 
So this is the front of the clinical guidance and it goes through the requirements uh, for the blood lead testing. Um, it's color coded so that you can follow the charts along. Uh, the first chart, which is in green, shows you the testing schedule. The second uh, yellow chart shows you the follow-up testing requirements. And the third, which we're going to talk a little bit now about next slide, shows you the follow-up recommendations for most of the children that you will see. So this is a sort of a shorthand table because it points out that we expect from uh, both the current testing data and historical testing data, uh, many if not most children when tested uh, may have a blood lead level of less than 5 micrograms per deciliter and they should just be uh, followed and then retested uh, at their second annual visit, the 24 month visit. Uh, we do expect that we will see a significant number of children with blood lead levels of 5 to 9 micrograms per deciliter. Um, and in fact, the likelihood is that this will be uh, the, the uh, number of children that have evoked the largest number of questions among providers, so we're going to spend time talking about that. Um, and then for children who have lead levels of 10 micrograms per deciliter or greater, there are legal and regulatory uh, resources and requirements that we will talk about in terms of how to manage those children. So next slide. So as we walk through, we want to take you through the clinical guidance for children with uh, a blood lead level of 5 to 9 uh, in particular. But this table on the back of the chart shows you in detail how to manage uh, the children with any blood lead level. So for children who have a blood lead level of less than 5, it is important to talk to the parents about pre prevention efforts and about avoiding lead hazards. It's important to do a general history and physical, uh, and it's always important, obviously, to look for signs of anemia and iron deficiency. We mention that particularly because, as you probably know, lead poisoning can cause a, 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 an anemia which uh, can both compound and mask uh, the symptoms of lead poisoning. So it is important to check for anemia, obviously, as part of general well child care, but in the context of lead poisoning, it has additional significance. Um, as we talk now more about the uh, children with a lead level of 5 to 9, those children are the children whom we expect you will be doing some clinical management of, and that includes, in addition to always doing the three things in terms of uh, anemia, primary prevention, and uh, looking for sources of lead exposure. Uh, there, it is very important to check those lead children again to make sure that they're not, being, they're not continuing to have lead exposure. This represents an opportunity with children of a blood lead level of 5 to 9 to prevent them from going on to have more serious blood lead exposures and to do primary prevention not only for them, but any children who subsequently live in the areas where they do. Um, and so this represents a significant opportunity. Next slide. So the bottom line for clinical management, that if you have a child for whom you have a blood lead that is confirmed of 5 micrograms per deciliter or greater, there are things that we want you to do and want you to be aware of as providers. We also, I just want to talk for a minute about capillary testing or point of care testing for those of you who are doing point of care testing about which I'll speak more in a minute because uh, as you know, capillary tests can have, if the skin is not uh, properly prepared um, or if there are other, there's other contamination, can have a, an, a lead level uh, that is higher than, uh, that, that it would need to be confirmed. And so for us, it is very important, and for you, it is very important as providers, as when you get a capillary test or a point of care test that is elevated, well, the first thing to do is to confirm that with a venous test. Um, and for all blood lead levels of 5 micrograms per deciliter or greater, the most important thing to do, if you take nothing away else away from this talk, we want to make sure that you talk with, uh, with the parents and caregivers about potential sources of lead, that you repeat the test as, after a month or more, and we'll go through those, to make sure that the lead level is going down because this is the most important thing, to make sure that the child is not continuing to be exposed to lead and that their lead level is not going up. This is the opportunity 
to prevent to do uh, to prevent the idea of continuing lead exposure and to protect those children and any children who could also be exposed to lead. And then finally, and, and both Ruth Ann and I will talk about this, to consider a home investigation uh, if the lead level is not going down because that represents an opportunity to do uh, effective prevention uh, for that child and other children. Next slide. So these are some uh, investigation, uh, when you're considering a home investigation, these are some resources to think about. Uh, the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has a helpline, which is a toll-free helpline, 866-703-3266. Uh, uh, and the Maryland Department of the Environment, which manages the lead poisoning screen, uh, 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 investigations program and is responsible for the regulations that deal with property owners. Uh, also has a toll-free line and works with local health departments on case management for children who have lead levels of 10 micrograms per deciliter or more. Um, the local health departments which work with the Maryland Department of the Environment in case management of children with lead poisoning, legal lead poisoning, uh, also are available as resources and then we're going to talk for a moment, uh, uh, in a moment, Ruthann will talk about notices of defect. So before we move on, just let me summarize this part by saying, for those of you who are involved in clinical management, just make sure that you, um, when you uh, are looking at a child, that you consider the whole child, you think about primary prevention, um, do lead testing, uh, make sure that you reach out to uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, we are available to you if you have clinical questions. Uh, local health departments and the Department of Environment are also available to you. And certainly if you have additional questions or your organizations have additional questions about uh, lead poisoning screening or clinical questions, uh, we are certainly available to talk with you either individually or collectively. So at that point, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I just want to mention one other thing which has to do with uh, point of care testing and school reporting forms. Um, so on point of care testing, last year uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene also revised its regulations related to point of care testing. Uh, there is a CLIA waived test uh, on the market which is available and it is no longer necessary to have a license from the department uh, of Health and Mental Hygiene Laboratories Administration for that test. It is, however, necessary to get what's called a letter of exemption uh, for that test. And so by contacting the laboratory's administration, you can then uh, do point of care testing um, and the, both the regulations and uh, the department have uh, made it easier to deal with the issues of uh, doing point of care testing, which does offer advantages to you in terms of getting to the patient immediately, having an answer immediately, being able to engage with the patient directly about lead testing. And so I would certainly encourage those of you who are considering uh, point of care testing to contact the department about further information. And then for those of you who are involved in school reporting, the school reporting requirements for parents uh, do still require that they provide lead testing information when they are uh, uh, putting their child, um, enrolling their child either in child care or in public pre-K, kindergarten, or first grade. And those requirements uh, are still in place. The department has a new form for that, which is available on our web website. Um, and for those of you who are involved in that, uh, the old form is still good while we do the transition to a new form. So if you go to the next slide, um, this will then take you, I think, to Ruth Ann Norton, my colleague, who can now talk about uh, non-clinical management issues. There you go, and thank you very much, Cliff, and uh, let me uh, thank our clinical partners and uh, uh, non-government partners and government partners on the line, uh, helping us to advance, I think, the mutual goal that we share with the state of Maryland, which is to actually end and eliminate childhood lead poisoning uh, in Maryland and across the country, and we are uh, delighted that the Governor Hogan has implemented universal blood lead testing as a means to help us uh, move forward. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the state and Cliff and Rachel uh, Hespatunda 
for the great work in getting these regulations uh, moving forward. Uh, you can go to the next slide here, Alex, but uh, the one point as we begin this is that community resources uh, to eliminate the exposures and source of exposures is critical in the healthcare to home uh, nexus and the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative is dedicated to the implementation of those resources to help families, not only in the home setting, but in schools and in daycares, uh, daycare settings, uh, to address the, the risks that are coming from housing in the form of paint, uh, water, and soil, uh, as well as in their school, daycare, and other environment. As we begin this, I'll just remind folks that it takes the equivalent of three granules of sugar, lead and dust, um, to poison a child, and we are every day fast learning the impact of lead and water on uh, the implementation or on the impact of kids. Um, so you have in front of you here how we're going, how uh, the response to an elevated blood lead level um, in Maryland for community resources. But um, as we think about this, I also want you to keep in mind that these same resources are available uh, to enact prevention. Uh, and that our, our work uh, begins there, and so our non-clinical response is available to all families who are at risk. But as a child who is, uh, that is uh, found to have an elevated blood lead level, that uh, elevated blood lead level is reported to the Maryland Department of the Environment who maintains the Childhood Lead Registry for the state of Maryland. They will then share those results with the local health department um, who, can, who, who often refers to our work at Green and Healthy Homes, but has its own interaction with families and with clinics. Uh, but that uh, referral coming in to Green and Healthy Homes as a community resource provider comes in from clinics, uh, from families, from word of mouth, from community outreach events, as well as health department referrals. Uh, let's go through what happens uh, in that scenario here. So we have a pretty detailed response uh, through the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, which works statewide in the state of Maryland. And we share this detailed response with other nonprofits and other non-government organizations who are wanting to build their capacity. Um, we've been at it for a long time, but we're looking to build that bench. Upon a referral, whether it is a self-referral from the clinic, from the health department, from the Department of the Environment, or otherwise, we will do a telephonic intake to determine eligibility for the various programs that are available uh, to families. This includes both renters and homeowner occupied uh, families. It includes helping uh, families in, in those circumstances as well as we'll talk about other outreach we do to contractors, property owners, and the like. Once we have the, done the baseline intake with a family, uh, and receive their approval to uh, move them forward, our case management team will then work with the family through in-home uh, visiting and uh, education to put together a family action plan. We're going to lo be looking with uh, environmental assessment and with visual and uh, technical assessment in the home for areas of risk and working with the family to identify those and what can their options for eliminating them. Uh, we will be providing and are providing feedback to the clinical or other referral agency to keep them engaged and informed. Um, and then we will work through the case management for the intervention response management. And if need be, if the family has other issues that are undermining their ability uh, to move forward, uh, either for their health or their housing situation, uh, we will work with external partners um, to ensure that we're getting the family in the best shape for a, a, a health uh, home environment and uh, neighborhood stabilization and health issues. The case management team is also responsible for all of the follow-up that happens. So one of the things that occurs in that home uh, visit is that we will review the risk awareness and the preventive measures available. We'll talk about behavioral health and structural changes that can happen. And we will work with the family on things such as the notice of defect. A notice of defect, which we'll detail a little bit more as we move forward, basically is a legal right uh, for tenants in the state of Maryland that allows them to move proactively when they have issues around chipping, peeling, flaking paint, or structural defects. We also will help families on application assistance 
for lead hazard control applications, for if need be relocation, or housing choice voucher uh, it, uh, support. We run a housing choice voucher program uh, here for the Baltimore uh, for Baltimore City uh, that is eligible for all uh, children and families with uh, blood lead levels uh, over five. We also have uh, a, a relocation fund available uh, for Baltimore City and can work uh, with owners uh, to provide relocation if necessary through the housing court system. Uh, the legal services team here uh, does work statewide in representing families in housing court to set up rental escrow, uh, to work on landlord negotiations, and when necessary to do referrals for enforcement, uh, coordinating with the Maryland Department of the Environment especially around fast-track cases, children with elevated blood lead levels over uh, 15. And our legal services and case management team will help in the filing of notices of defect, uh, which uh, can be done on any form, but we'll, we'll go through the actual form that we have and the state has uh, here in just a second. The other piece that uh, GHHI has and coordinates with is environmental control. Um, we have our own crews that do lead hazard reduction. Uh, Baltimore City has a federal grant, a HUD grant, to do lead hazard reduction. Uh, they were awarded $3.7 million last year to conduct uh, this work in over 200 houses. Uh, we can do uh, other work for uh, middle income and upper income families on a fee for service basis. And I should also say that Baltimore County has a lead hazard control uh, program uh, for resources there as does the state of Maryland. So we can uh, work with families based on income to do source remediation uh, in the home. Uh, and we, will, we are now expanding that to including testing of water and testing of soil where applicable. We also in the community do a lot of education and training. Uh, most of it we are trying to focus on prevention, but certainly uh, the, the implementation of this testing regulation are critical to that. But our training uh, goes everywhere from uh, preschool all the way through uh, to grandparents. Uh, we have specific training for homeowners. Uh, as Cliff noted, the profile of lead poison children in the state has changed a lot in terms of who we're seeing. And at about a third of the children that we see getting, uh, who have elevated levels in the state come from homeowner occupied properties of all income levels. Uh, we're working to train contractors as a new face of health care and ensuring that we implement the federal regulations as well as state regulations on training for contractors. Maryland has probably the strictest training uh, curriculum for contractors and we want the public to know about that and we want contractors to be fully trained. Uh, we do a lot of training and uh, are the largest trainer of rental property owners on implementation of Maryland's lead risk reduction in housing law. Uh, we will work with owners to get into compliance to understand both their uh, responsibilities and rights and how we can assist them if they don't have the financial resources. Much of this work is also around working with policymakers, uh, which will include hopefully lowering uh, the legal level uh, for lead poisoning in the state of Maryland in the coming uh, year. So let's go to the next slide we have here. So this is the infamous notice of defect, uh, but uh, as I said, the notice of defect can be written on the back of an envelope on a piece of paper. Uh, it just needs to be delivered to rental property owners by tenants uh, living in uh, any pre-78 rental housing unit, uh, basically outlining if there are defects around chipping, peeling, flaking paint, which is actually a violation of law in the state of Maryland under housing code. And under the Maryland Lead Risk Reduction and Housing Law, it should be understood that all, home, all rental properties built before 1978 are presumed by law to have lead unless proven otherwise, unless the property has been cleared as lead uh, free or limited lead free. This notice of defect uh, around chipping paint, around uh, uh, structural defects, gets filed with owners. It triggers owners. Uh, to go through a 30-day period where they have to go back and do an uh, assessment of the rental unit and, if necessary, to do a modified risk reduction, which includes the repair of potential hazards and lead dust testing, lead clearance testing uh, for that unit. 
If the owner does not respond properly within 30 days, they're subject to enforcement uh, through the state and also uh, through uh, the rental escrow statutes uh, in housing court. So this is some of the materials, uh, the uh, highlighted materials that we provide uh, to, and, and, and we are wanting to make sure that every health department and organization has these materials. If you do not, let us know. But this is to cover the gamut of information uh, that families should know. Uh, diet is critically important in helping to ward off and lower uh, the absorption of lead. Uh, the chips, peels, flakes, and dust uh, reviews uh, preventive measures, risk awareness, and legal rights. And the protect your, that for, for Maryland and throughout the country actually, the protect your family from lead in the home is a legal document that is required along with the notice of defect to be given to every renter in the state of Maryland and the protect your family uh, is a federal document that is required to be given to every homeowner at the time of purchase. The renovate right uh, document that you see there on the far right is required for contractors who are disturbing paint in pre-78 properties, whether they're rental or homeowner occupied, to provide to the resident and the owner uh, and reviews the safety measures that they need to be following. That document requires a signature um, and in the rental agreements and sale agreements there is a page for signature for the protect your family uh, documents as well as the notice of defect that all have to be given out. Um, and the federal government does a relatively good job of uh, enforcement, uh, could do better obviously, but does a relatively good job in ensuring enforcement of the federal uh, disclosures. So there's other additional resources. Uh, this is just an example of uh, the application for the uh, uh, city of Baltimore. Uh, but those resources include, as I said, the lead hazard control money in the city of Baltimore, which also is coupled with healthy housing uh, funding that can look at other environmental health threats, as the same for Baltimore County. Uh, and the State Department of Housing and Community Development has a program uh, that can do low interest uh, to no interest loans uh, for lead hazard control. Uh, GHHI and other partners um, can assist families with this application. We're happy to come to your clinic or your civic association also and do training and information so that we can get this into the hands of families. So we have one goal, um, and uh, we never use pictures that aren't don't have cute kids. You're not allowed to be in any pictures without being cute, I think. Uh, but it is to prevent childhood lead poisoning. And, you know, we, we look at the return on investment often that for every dollar invested in childhood lead poisoning prevention, uh, the federal government study shows a 17 to $221 return to taxpayers, but it goes far beyond that. It goes to school performance and reading levels, improved IQ, it increases the stock of safe, affordable housing. Maryland has some of the most expensive housing uh, in the country, especially for rental housing. I just saw the other day that you have to make $25 an hour to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment on average uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, lead poisoning has a direct impact on special education and learning uh, and on juvenile crime and delinquency. Uh, children poisoned by lead are seven times more likely to drop out of school and six times more likely to have interaction with uh, the juvenile justice system over the course of their lifetime. And there are reduced health care costs if we are focusing on prevention. Uh, but what we really care about is the arc and trajectory of children, as well as adults, uh, to be healthier and more productive. And lead poisoning prevention is at the heart of that, as we know uh, that this country has really reflected on Flint and other uh, highlights that uh, show us still the toxic legacy that uh, we hope to end. Um, so everything before we move on to some of the resources, I'd like to ask some some questions of the attendees if that's okay. Absolutely. The one thing I do want is you'll have our information for contact at the end, but we do run a hotline uh, for uh, families and we are more than happy to answer questions of any kind um, for clinics or families. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Alex. Sure. So this first uh, poll question is going to just simply ask where you are located. 
Um, this is so that we can know sort of where people are tuning in from um, to better understand uh, our data as we sort of move forward and try and educate folks all around the state um, as these new guidelines. So we'll give you guys about 30 more seconds or so for this poll. While we're doing this, I just want to remind people that we are recording this webinar. Yes. Uh, it will be available on our website. We actually tapped out people who wanted to be on the webinar today. We're not able to do that. We may offer it again if I can convince Cliff to do this one more time. Uh, but it will be available on our website. And we, we're also planning to email it in a video file form to every attendee uh, on the webinar, as well as the folks who tried to get in. but but were too late and got tapped out. So, so you, that email should be coming sometime tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to close this poll simply so we can move on to the next one, which is which asks um, what sort of work you are doing with regards to lead poisoning prevention. So that poll is now open. It should be on your screen. And and this poll reminds me that really the this. Um, this reflects the wide spectrum of people who are involved in lead poisoning prevention. Uh, we work very closely with our federal partners, the EPA, CDC, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, we are uh, at the State Health Department. <clears throat> we work very closely with our uh, agency, the Department of the Environment, which is responsible for enforcing lead regulations here. Uh, and we work very closely with insurers, um, uh, managed care organizations, uh, clinical organizations, and community-based organizations like GHHI and others. Um, it is important for, for us very much um, the role that all of you play in helping to uh, reduce and el ultimately eliminate lead poisoning prevention. Um, all of you, regardless of sort of where you are in this picture, are, uh, play an important role in this process and we are grateful to you um, and certainly appreciate all the efforts that uh, you make to uh, uh, address this problem. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the last couple of polls are simply about how useful, useful you found the information, so I'm going to ask that one first. So this is simply for us to sort of see how useful we found the information. And while this poll is going, I just want to also mention um, that uh, several handouts are available for download from this webinar directly that you can download at any time. Um, many of you probably already have, um, but those, those downloads include um, the updated guidelines to um, lead uh, testing. Um, as well as those resources made available to tenants, um, resources made available to homeowners. Um, this slide deck um, is also available for download, um, as well as one other, uh, oh, the Hyundai uh, Notice of Defect. So all of those are available for download. Um, thank you for that one. And we have one more poll for you, which is, about how this may affect your um, practice. So how likely you are to change your practices as a result of this webinar. So <clears throat> one of the things that we will do, we will take the information that you provided, which we are very much appreciate, uh, to fine tune this information. If you have suggestions about other materials that you think or other resources that you think would be helpful, um, I will emphasize the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will shortly be sending out a packet to, to primary providers, insurers, uh, local health departments, and others that will contain the lead screening questionnaire, the clinical guidance document, the laminated clinical guidance uh, guidelines that, I'm, that we described earlier, um, and uh, other resources, uh, uh, including bilingual resources for those of you who may have uh, non-English speakers in your practice. Um, and, and finally, as we move to those resources, I want to say, uh, again, for us, uh, the most important thing for you as cl clinical providers um, 
we recognize that every day you have an incredibly busy schedule and, and many, many things that you have to keep in mind as you take care of kids. Uh, we want to make it easy for you to incorporate this information into your existing practices. Um, and certainly, if there's anything we can do to help you, uh, is as we do this transition to testing of all children, um, please contact uh, uh, me at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene um, if there's anything else that you uh, would like the department to uh, focus on in this transition. Um, these are the links and resources that are available to you. They include the Departments of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Maryland Department of the Environment, uh, your local health department, uh, GHHI, Baltimore City Health Department, Baltimore City uh, Housing and Community Development also, uh, and the State uh, Department of Housing and Community Development also involved in this, and then some other resources. And um, as we finish up, let me again thank uh, Ruth Ann Norton for uh, hosting this webinar, GHHI for hosting this webinar, and uh, please, uh, if there's anything at all we can help you with, uh, we are all engaged in this effort together, uh, and please feel free to reach out to us as we uh, uh, continue this uh, effort. Yep, and Cliff, I want to thank you all, at, uh, Rachel and you and the state again. I uh, want to thank Alex Badakin from our staff for pulling this all together. Uh, I, what I am going to encourage people to do is if you want resources or how to connect your clients, uh, your your um, colleagues or others to the community resources for lead hazard control uh, and investigation, please call us at 410-534-6447. We also have an 800 line that's not up here, which is 800-370-LEAD or 800-370-5323. We will assist families with applications. The one link that is not up on the, the screen there is the link to Baltimore City's lead as a control program, but we do application process for them, and so we will handle that, uh, as well as assisting families with other uh, resources and training. We thank everybody for joining us today, and uh, we will talk with you soon. Thank and happy Healthy Homes Month.